Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many here. We were expecting a few more, so either the weather or a Friday afternoon or who knows what um, might have encouraged them to go elsewhere, but I'm sure there will be some stragglers who come in as we, we go through the afternoon. Um, I want to start by saying welcome and hello. My name is Rosemary, for those of you who don't know me. So I'm Rosemary Chable. I'm Deputy Director of Nursing here and Deputy Director of Education and Workforce. Um, and one of the lovely things I get to do is host these great um, show, showcase events, really, where we can really have the opportunity to delve deep into um, a subject that is of interest to people. Um, and those of you who know me will know that it's always a privilege to introduce these, but for me it's a particular privilege to introduce this one because um, my clinical background is medicine for older people. and. Uh, fairly large chunk of my heart is probably still up on G level um, on medicine for older people. So for me, listening to this this afternoon is going to be absolutely fabulous. Um, I've heard Jackie speak before and um, I think we're in for a really good afternoon. So um, please think about your questions you might like to ask her, not to put her on the spot, but she has made sure that she's got time in the session um, for plenty of questions at the end as well. So please think of some of those as, as we go along and have those ready and stored up for when we have a bit of time at the end. Um, I'm not going to waste any more of her air time because it's her you've come to see, although I do feel particularly pleased this afternoon because Kay has kindly described me as the wonderful Rosemary Chamber on Twitter, which I don't often get on Twitter, so I'm retweeting it like a, a like thing. Um, so thank you very much, Kay, that was lovely. Um, but yeah, you've come to see Jackie, not me, so Jackie, kick off, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk to you this afternoon. It's such a pleasure and a privilege. Um, this organisation, as you know, um, is supportive in all kinds of ways to the research that we do in health sciences um, and to our students as well. And it's just really nice to come and hopefully give something back. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Um, I'd particularly like to say thank you. Some of the research I'm going to be presenting today um, that this hospital has been very closely connected with, and in fact, Rosemary has been uh, one of the co investigators on one of the studies. Uh, we've got research nurses here in the audience, and perhaps um, staff hospital wards have been involved in the research. And uh, again, thank you for your contributions. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, creating uh, therapeutic environments for older people in the hospital. And it's going to be very much focused on the compassionate care side of. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to see the links through um, to other aspects of care. Uh, so starting off a picture, this is my dad and my daughter. This is Peter Bridges and my daughter Daisy. Uh, at Christmas, um, four and a half years ago, and um, they're working out how to uh, learn to use an engineering um, electronic set that uh, my mom and dad bought for Daisy for Christmas. Um, and um, I really love this picture. And I love it um, because um, Dad was very ill at the time. In fact, he died just a few weeks later. And we didn't realize he was dying, but we knew something was very wrong. Um, but at that moment in time, he is well um, because his health issues have taken a back seat. He's really engaged, as you can see, in working out how to use the um, set. He was an engineer, um, so engineer at heart, he's really loving that. And he's loving time, uh, spending time with his granddaughter, because um, he was a real family man as well. And so for us, those times when health issues took a back seat were really precious. And I think this is one of the things that I want to hold on to in this talk about older people's care, that actually that not that our job to try and help people uh, to help the health issues to take a back seat so they can concentrate on living their life and on quality of life in those moments. So that's where I wanted to start. And I suppose caring for people in this way when their needs are very complex and especially in hospital settings can be really hard. How do we create environments um, where the individual's needs can become central to everything that happens. Um, and in a way that means that we can put those health issues on the back seat for them outside the hospital for as long as possible. And I'm going to be arguing today that actually it's really difficult to care for people in that way. 
unless we're caring for ourselves and caring for each other as well. There's the electronics there. Ah, I don't know if anybody looks familiar to you in that picture. Uh, that's me, the second on the left, uh, back in the 1980s in my first staff nurse post. So I wanted to reflect on um, how things, some things are the same and some things are different to those days. Um, I was one of the few people to do a nursing uh, degree um, in those days. And when I graduated, I worked here on M7 at Manchester Royal Infirmary. There were 22 beds on the ward, half of them care for older people, half of them diabetes. I've got somebody nodding, do you know how I? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, half of them diabetes, half care for older people. I don't remember particular problems with, um, with patients backing up in A&E, um, or really a particular urgency about discharging people back to the community. Um, if somebody needed some more inpatient care, if, uh, beyond b being acutely ill, there was a long stay hospital barns in Cheadle down the road where they could be transferred to and spend as much time as they needed to um, there. Um, on M7 we did eight hour shifts roughly, we started at quarter to eight in the morning and that ran till 3.30 in the afternoon and then there was a late shift that came on uh, about one o'clock, I, I think I remember that. Uh, and they work till 8.30 in the evening. Um, I get up about quarter past five for an early shift because it took a lot of work to get that hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I also needed to have my first cigarette of the day before leaving the house. Um, so I get to work at um, quarter to eight and work through. And then when lunchtime came, the late shift would come on and we'd have about two and a half hours overlap between the shifts where um, there'd be a long handover that most people sat in on. There was one or two out on the floor, but most people were there. And that really gave you the time to do a proper handover, where you perhaps went in depth with some patients, where you need to talk things through. It's an opportunity to um, discuss the business of the hospital, um, to talk through uh, particular issues, and also some time for staff education as well. Um, so, um, what was the other thing? I, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out was actually banking agency staff in those days were really rare. You you might get one or two on a late shift, but that was it. Um, and so generally, you're working with the same set of people because the number of beds on the board was quite small. Actually, that was quite that was quite a small set of people, and you got to know each other. You knew the strengths and weaknesses. You could you knew when you needed to sort of kick in with support, and you could ask for help um, when you needed it. And I had some quite tough times. But, you know, we all do in nursing. And particularly when you're newly qualified, it's quite a vulnerable time. And I always remember there was somebody there for me when, when I needed, needed it. And I'm not telling you this because I want to go back to the golden days when all the consultants were doctors and they were all God as well, <laughs> and nurses knew their place. Um, but because I think that the support systems for staff haven't kept up with the way that nursing work has changed. And I think some things have started to disappear, perhaps disappeared altogether, that we've not really paid attention to. So that's why I'm harking back to them, because there are things like the length of the shifts and the overlap between the shifts and the stability of the nursing team that actually we can't rely on these days. And you know for yourself that makes that can make a really big difference to people feeling um, supported. And we also know that the population of patients in hospitals are older, sicker, uh, they tend to be there uh, for much shorter stays. And this doesn't just mean that the work's more intensive, but it also means that um, it's really tough as a member of staff to build relationships with individual patients beyond the fleeting encounter. So you might not have that sort of sustained relationship that you build over, over some days. So what do older people need when they come into hospital? Well, the same as everyone else. They want to be diagnosed and treated quickly. They want to leave hospital as soon as possible with a good plan that aids their return to the community and continues what treatment's been started in hospital. Uh, avoidance of harm while they're in hospital, help with uncomfortable symptoms, help with activities of daily living when they need it, um, such as eating, washing, and to be treated like a human being. So what do they experience when they come into hospital? Well, as you know, on arrival, um, a number of things can happen that can very quickly uh, strip somebody of their identity and feelings of self-worth. They're often in the hands of people and processes that can feel very powerful. They're changed out of their own clothes. They're placed in environments where the needs of other patients are very visible and audible to them, as is how very busy the staff seem. 
And that can make it really hard to ask for help when they need it. There's a clear focus on medical matters in the assessments and decisions. Um, and that can sometimes feel that other matters, such as being in pain or needing a wee or a drink or worrying about your cat, aren't worth staff's attention. And in this environment, it can be really um, hard and embarrassing to ask for help with, for instance, moving about or using the toilet. I don't think I'm telling anybody anything new here, but I'm just drawing attention to it. But this puts people in a situation where it's very hard to identify, to say what's important to them, to point out that something's been missed, to ask for help. So when we just focus on the admitting condition, uh, the illness or the injury that's brought someone in, rather than the person, um, important things can get missed. And I think older people are one of those groups for whom this can mean poorer outcomes. So what does good relational care look like? Um, this is based on a uh, review that I did of old people's experiences in care, looking at a number of the studies that help describe this, but actually it applies across patient um, groups. So older people want staff when they come into hospital to see who I am. So to appreciate who I am as a human being, what's important to me and what my individual needs are. And that's an important part of maintaining their identity. To establish a warm, human, open connection um, where I feel able to ask for what I need and I feel treated with an unconditional positive regard and to involve me so I understand what's happening and I get involved in important decisions and little decisions not just about um, the, the matters of treatment but about whether, where, whether or not to have a wash and how I have a wash and when I have a wash that kind of thing. so finding out what my goals are and how can you work towards them are also part of the So who's most at risk of a bad experience? This comes from that same review. Uh, people with dementia or delirium are at particular risk of these things not happening for them. Ooh. People with difficulties communicating hearing or understanding. People from ethnic minority groups, especially where there's a language difference. People with low functional ability and or high physical disability. People without regular visitors um, and support from family or others. So, of older people, these are the groups that you target at highest risk of having poor experience. And people are end up. So, I'm going to talk to you now about some research that I have done with um, Katie Featherstone from Cardiff University. Um, and this research had quite a lot of publicity on the BBC and elsewhere a couple of months ago, so you might have heard of it. And it was a study uh, where uh, we used ethnography, so a really close attention to what actually happens in practice. Um, and it looked at when people with dementia are in hospital, what happens, how do staff respond when they resist or refuse the care that's offered to them? Um, so what is it that happens? Um, when, when people with dementia uh, behave in this way. And um, Katie and her research team um, looked at the care in five hospitals in the UK, um, all NHS hospitals, and in those hospitals they concentrate on care in the acute medical units and in trauma and orthopedia wards. So um, data gathered from across five hospitals in those two different specialties. And um, what Katie found was that uh, resistance and refusal of care was a routine and expected part of everyday life in those wards. So every person that they, with dementia that they um, observed actually refused or resisted care at some point or another. Um, so it was a there was a really high prevalence there. And the sort of resistance uh, was that people would resist food, medications and personal care. Um, when um, Katie and her team looked at the way that staff uh, were behaving, they saw that the completion of timetabled activities, such as meal times, medications rounds, planned personal care, getting things done by certain times, actually were prioritised over what individual patients needed in that um, particular moment. And this meant that um, patients resisted care further, so there was a cycle of resistance that was building there. Um, Katie also observed that staff were also seen trapped in these cycles and, and seemed to have very little discretion to 
to step outside of those timetabled routines to respond to what that patient needed in that moment in time. I'm going to read you an extract from the data to try and bring this to life a little. Mary is a patient um, who's been observed at the time. Mary still has a healthcare assistant next to her and is still trying to stand up. Uh, a registered nurse has observed what's going on but's not intervening. The healthcare assistant is getting sterner, making Mary sit back on her bed, not asking her to sit. The HCA is clearly concerned but is getting increasingly annoyed with Mary and has asked for help from another HCA passing the bed. They curtain Mary and I hear Mary loudly shouting, get off me now, no, get off my hands. The HEA is asking Mary by her first name to hold her hands, trying to reassure her. Um, and then later on, uh, the HEA brings more chairs onto the bay, assisting a patient across the bay, while another HEA assists, and one of the HEAs is with Mary. Mary seems to be very tightly um, tucked into her bed with a blanket now. She's now lying back under her blanket, looking around and tapping her feet, no longer trying to stand up other than Mary, the bay is calm. Later on, Mary's trying to get up again. The HEA again reprimands her to lie back down verbally, very firmly, which she does. The HEA comes over to the nurse's station and apologises for her little nervous breakdown, this is in quotes, earlier. While dealing with Mary earlier, she had got very upset and went to the sluice room, closed the door after her, but was quite clearly crying, visibly upset by having to restrain and argue with her. So I think what these findings illustrate is how strong those drivers are in shaping the work that people do, but also that um, members of staff don't just need high level skills to try and pick a particular situation and work out how to do what's best for that patient, um, but it's often they have to be, do this throughout their shift, um, often for more than one patient at a time, and in the face of pressures that can undermine helping with what the patient actually needs. So I think we're not just talking about skill here, um, but we're talking about the capacity, the time and the resilience to be able to consistently relate to every patient as a human being. So what's it like for staff? In another review, we looked at nurses' experiences um, working in hospital. And uh, what was clear is that um, when you look back up, when you compare what nurses want from their interactions with patients, it's the same as what patients want. So they want to be able to see who patients are as people, to connect with them and to involve, involve them um, to the best that they can. Um, and that whether or not they can meet their um, aspirations for work significantly affects how they feel about their work, but they often feel blocked, particularly in general ward settings, from being able to deliver the sort of care um, they'd like to. So if as a nurse um, you can meet these aspirations, it feels great, doesn't it? It feels gratifying, enriching, a real privilege to deliver uh, the care that you feel you're there um, to do and that you've helped someone with their distress. And if you can't, it feels really horrible. And I think this is one of the hardest things about looking after older people, that if you can't help them, you feel morally responsible, that you feel guilty, you feel frustrated, you feel regretful. And these are the foundations for stress, for burnout, um, for emotional withdrawal, perhaps withdrawal from that uh, ward, perhaps withdrawal from nursing altogether. So I'd emphasize here that often um, I think the finger is pointed at nursing staff for not being caring enough and what I'm trying to emphasise here actually is about how we create the conditions in which people feel able to be caring um, as much of the time as possible and that actually it's not a matter of people not, not feeling um, compassionate anymore but it's about feeling blocked from being um, compassionate. So, um, in thinking about what are these conditions that would support people to be compassionate and could we actively create them or support them in busy hospital settings these days? This is what this um, last study is that I'm going to talk to you about. And this is one that this trust has been particularly actively involved in. It builds on other work that suggests that if as a team, at a team level, so at a ward team level, you can work on developing workplace learning, empathy between team members, 
peer support and a positive culture, that is probably going to be more effective at supporting compassionate caring practices than if you took everybody out to a training classroom and said, this is how you can be compassionate with people. So it's about what happens back on the ward. It's about that local culture that supports those practices. So we developed an intervention called CLEC, which stands for Creating Learning Environments for Compassionate Care. And the National Institute for Health Research, the NIHR, funded a study of its feasibility. And it focused on, can we put these ideas of CLEC into practice in a busy acute setting? Um, and also, how do we measure if it actually makes a difference to patient care? Because you want to know that um, putting effort and resources in that way actually makes a difference. So I'm going to focus on the first question today. Can we put these ideas um, into practice? Um, so CLEC focuses on uh, if you create a work environment for teams in which learning and development for all staff is valued, um, as is teamwork, dialogue, mutual support, innovation, shared goals, continuous improvement, and where everybody's rec recognised to make a contribution. If you can build an environment of this kind, um, team, team members should have a higher uh, relational capacity and should feel more able to deliver um, compassionate care. So that's the sort of theory, the programme theory behind uh, the ideas of collect. And the sort of activities are, it starts with a four month um, period um, during which the team gets introduced to particular ways of working and they try them out and they adapt them to fit that particular um, place and they work out what's helpful and what isn't. A practice development nurse is allocated to the team to help facilitate um, this process. And in this study we tried out the idea with four nursing teams in two different hospitals. They begin by taking it a day away from the workplace as a team. Um, in all places, we couldn't manage to, you, know, you won't be surprised by this, we couldn't manage to get the whole team away, even though we tried. Uh, so we had to split the team into three, and, and eight, a third of the team at a time went away uh, with the ward manager present on all three of the days um, to have some time away to talk about what it was like to work there, to talk about compassionate care, to talk about what they were proud of, and what they'd like to change. And for, the, for those teams, it was their first opportunity to actually meet outside of the workplace and talk about work. Um, also, uh, the ward managers had monthly action learning sets to give them support in developing their compassionate um, leadership role and um, also regular meetings with matrons. Uh, we, built, we tried to work with the teams to build in um, spaces during the working day on the ward that they could actually get together um, and engage in some of the activities we were trying to promote. Um, team members were trained to do observations of practice, so to take time away from clinical work, out of uniform, just to sit and watch the care that went on with, with a view to feeding that back to their peers. And also, at the end of the four months, the idea was that the team would have developed a plan for how they would then want to take that forward in the future and to have a conversation with, with trust managers as to how to make that possible, recognising there might be additional resources uh, required for that. So that's a quick whiz through um, some of the activities that was happening in that four month period, but the idea was it became a sustainable thing that then um, ran, ran itself, not ran itself, but the team then owned and continued with. So we focused on, um, some of what we focused on in the study was to do the groundwork to run a future trial to see if we could measure that CLEC made a difference and also to explore um, its cost effectiveness. Um, and so some of the things that we did for that future trial, we did some before and after measures of quality of interaction between staff and patients. Um, we asked nurses to fill out questionnaires that measured their empathy levels um, and we asked patients to fill out some questionnaires as well. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you any more about that today because there isn't really time, but there are publications that you can look up that I'll be happy to um, point you towards. And a bit later on, I'll come back to the quality of interaction data because I think there's some findings you'll be interested in there. So to actually look at can we make this work in practice, we did quite a lot of interview-based work where we um, kept in touch with uh, ward managers, and um, RNs and HCAs on the ward and interviewed them over time. So we interviewed them right at the beginning and in the middle at the end to try and get their perspective on what was working, whether or not it was working, what was getting in the way, 
um, and uh, what they understood by what was happening. Um, so I've already said six wards, four of them were mental world people, two of them were surgical, and we had uh, the usual appendix approval. Um, so what did we find from these interviews? And we also did a few observations um, of nursing practice. We found that uh, CLEC was really welcomed by staff and they found that most of the activities were possible to do within the busy ward environment, which was a really positive finding. And they reported that they felt their own well-being had benefited and the patient care had benefited as well. They really liked um, the check-ins or clusters, which were mid-shift, five minute, get everybody off the floor and just check in on how everybody is and do they need any support. They really, really liked those. Um, because otherwise it felt there was very little opportunity to support each other's well-being. And they also liked study days as well, because I felt it was a chance to get to know each other as people and to have conversations they didn't normally have a chance um, to do. Um, here's an example of an HCA. So whereas before they might know that Orange Bay is heavier than Green Bay, they might not necessarily have volunteered to go and help. Now they're much more aware that if they're going, well actually we're struggling, well, we're not, we'll come and help you. And I think that's because of the check-ins and the fact that we're all sitting down and going, is there anything we can do to help you? And if they're going, well, actually, I've got a really poorly patient, so I've been struggling with the others. Right, well, then, we'll come and help you. And it's made them more aware of each other. A ward manager. Collect for me is about giving staff the empowerment to feel like they can sit and do things with patients that are compassionate rather than task orientated. So rather than just doing the obs and just doing the washes, just having a chat with the patients about their life, their family, or sitting and doing activity with them, rather than just, we've got to get the washes done, we've got to get the observations done, which do still need to be done, but it's about giving staff that empowerment of being able to say, let's do something a bit different. So hold on to that, let's do something a bit different, and come back to that. So other findings apart from the benefits, um, were that actually, um, some things didn't stick and some things stuck in some areas. Actually, they stuck in most areas during the four months, but they didn't carry on sticking. And we noticed that there was a difference um, between the ward teams. Um, and some of the um, lack of sticking, we attributed some of that to the limitations of the acute setting. So the intensity of the work limited the time that nurses and HCAs had to uh, participate. Um, but also in situations where um, financial constraints are high, actually workplace learning for staff comes quite low down the list of priorities and so sometimes the signals were there of other things needing to take um, priority. Uh, we did notice that if we hadn't just targeted CLEC at the teams and thought about actually how could we more actively draw in other key people visiting the ward and other managers in the organisation to help them think about their role in relation to supporting the team to use CLEC. Um, we might have shifted um, some of the re receptiveness there as well. So uh, one of the things that we've done is developed a newer version of CLEC where we do do that more active engagement with managers and other people who visit the ward. Um, and so the differences between teams, uh, we could explain um, in our data in um, leadership style um, from the ward managers, in support from the matrons, um, in, I suppose, cultures that were top down versus bottom up. So the extent to which uh, tasks and targets predominated over that ability of individual people to feel able to say, let's do something a little bit different here for this patient. Um, so some um, ward teams felt able that they were able to do something a little, a little bit different and some didn't feel that that was within their discretion. Um, an example of um, a really supportive uh, matron. So my matron's been very supportive the whole way through. We've kept regular contact, she's been asking for updates She's known about the interventions that we've done on the ward and has been really supportive. In contrast, in another place, um, some of the staff felt a little, little bit disappointed. They made these suggestions and took their time to do them. And then no one really followed it through or said, yes, we can use that, or no, we can't. It just got left. And this is an example of what happened in the less receptive environments. 
that um, staff did engage and they felt good about it and they began to see themselves as innovators in a way that they hadn't before but actually it wasn't their ideas weren't followed through they didn't feel they had the power to follow them through um, and equally they didn't feel supported by more senior personnel in following that through so in that situation they became disillusioned and then and then it's hard to keep going in, in those circumstances so that's what happened in some of, some of the rules you're not, you're not being watched, although we are, we are being filled. Uh, so now I do want to talk a little bit about staffing levels and skill mix, because of course that's part of the picture here. Um, and part of uh, the relational capacity of teams and organisations. So when we talked to staff about some of the barriers to compassionate care on the ward, of course lack of time came up a lot. And when we talked to them about their engagement with CLEC, again lack of time came up. And this is, this is consistent in research that this of this kind that people will talk about when well, we haven't got the time because we've got other priorities. Um, so I mentioned earlier that one of the outcome measures that we tested out for a future trial was um, looking at the quality of interaction between staff and patients. So we would have a researcher sitting on a bay uh, with one or two target patients who've been consented into the study. Um, and uh, that researcher would watch those, those patients for a two hour period and every single time a member of staff came up and interacted with them, the researcher would then gather information about that interaction, what was happening, when it started, when it finished, um, and also rated the quality of it. And there's five possible ratings that they could give it. There are two positive ones, positive social um, and positive care, I need to forgot what it was then, um, and then a middle one which was neutral and then two negative uh, ratings. And ideally of course what you'd want to see on a ward uh, that's delivering compassionate care is that all the ratings are positive or perhaps neutral um, and that none of the ratings are negative. Um, uh, I think that's all I want to say to introduce to you. So what were some of the findings um, from using this in the study? We did 240 hours of observation across the six wards. Uh, we observed the care of 270 patients and we observed over 3,000 interactions between patients and staff. We had a really good uh, recruitment rate, so anybody involved in the research will know how hard it is to recruit old sick people in hospital, but look at that, 93%. I will go to my grave with pride at that. <laughs> um, and I think what it was is we weren't asking people to do anything. It was just we were saying, do you mind if we watch your care? Um, and we also had, re we worked really hard at involving people with dementia and other forms of cognitive because of our recognition that they are likely to have a, a poorer experience. And so about one in four of our sample had cognitive impairment, which is about you know, equivalent to what you'd expect to see um, in the adult population in general hospitals. So again, proud of that one. Um, so patients had about six interactions per hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average it was about six an hour. This was any member of staff, not just nursing. Uh, median interaction length was about 35 seconds and most were rated um, as positive care or positive social, the overwhelming majority. And a total of about 10% were rated. So when people, so one of the questions you might have be saving up for me at the end is, well, don't people change their behaviour when they know they're being watched? Well, I say, well, actually, we still observe 10% negative interactions, so even if they were trying they weren't entirely uh, successful at that. Uh, we also noticed quite a high variation between the wards. So when we looked at baseline, on one of the wards, 2% of interactions were negative. On another of the wards, it was 18%. So quite, that's quite a big variation um, between the wards. So then we looked at um, the odds of getting um, a negative rating. So what are, given all the other information we gathered around the interactions, what are the factors that are associated with getting a negative rating? So when patients are older, when they're agitated, and interestingly, when there's more than one member of staff involved in an interaction, you're significantly more likely to have a negative interaction as a patient. So I can perhaps understand the age one, I can understand the agitation one, but the staff one, I don't know. You might have some things you can share with me at the end to help me understand 
um, that one. Cognitive impairment, in fact, didn't, wasn't so, um, independently associated with um, the odds of a more negative rating, but agitation was. If um, visitors were present, the odds went down. If um, RN staffing levels were um, eight or more um, patients per RN, the odds of a negative interaction were significantly higher. If um, HDA staffing levels uh, decreased, then the odds were higher as well. Not so significant. Um, we also looked at the rate of interaction, so not surprisingly, when HDA levels were low, then the rate of interaction went down, so patients were visited less often, which doesn't, you know, that kind of makes sense. But when RN levels were low, the rate of interactions went up. I'm coming to my stunning conclusion. <laughs> um, but time with patients stayed the same regardless of what staffing levels was. So this means, um, sorry, because I know it's quite a lot to track on a Friday afternoon, but keep, stay with me, bear with me, it'll be worth it. When RN levels were low, so when there were eight or more patients per RN, you would get more shorter interactions of lower quality. So the total amount of time didn't change, but actually what was going on in those interactions was clearly different. When you added, when we added more HCAs in the model, that didn't help improve the quality of interaction, which tells us something about substitution. Um, in fact, the quality got worse. So. This is in the context, if there's any HCAs in the audience, I am not slagging you off. Because actually, when you look at HCA quality of interaction and RN quality of interaction, it's the same. There's no difference. This is about the mix of people on the wards and the different ways they support each other to do each other's uh, job. Because if you look at it the other way around, again, it's less so. But when HCA levels were low, actually adding in more RNs didn't particularly help. So it's really important to have both groups of staff, but you don't solve your staffing problems by adding in more people um, of um, more people who are, who are HDAs. So, moving towards the conclusions, um, if you if we want programs like CLEC to work better, then it's not enough. Um, to target just the team and to work with the team. Actually, you've got to look at the organisation and how you engage the wider organisation to reshape the conditions in which individuals and teams are able to act. And I like to think about relational capacity, that it belongs to organisations, not to the individuals within it. And when you've got an organisation that's got high relational capacity, then your staff wellbeing will be higher and compassionate care to the reasonable likely. So what does that mean? What does high relational capacity look like? How do our findings help us to understand that? So it means that in an organisation, attention is paid to relationships between staff as well as between staff and patients, and that the see who I am and connect with me and involve me is as important to staff as it is to patients. Um, staff want to be seen who they are as individuals, they want to feel connected to um, by, by their colleagues, and they want to feel involved in important decisions. They feel empowered to speak out and to innovate. Um, their contributions valued and their expertise is valued, whatever position they hold in the nursing team or in other teams. Work teams are supported to learn and to meet together. And leaders understand and shape the conditions in which people can act. And they signal this in their everyday interactions. Every time they come onto the ward, they signal what's important. And workforce has the skills, knowledge, and time to engage in relation to work. So, back to the original question, can, how do we um, create therapeutic environments uh, for older people in hospital? So we know that being old and in poor health can be really hard, uh, but with the right support and skilled nursing care, um, this can be made less hard. And the moments like this one that I showed you, Dad, at Christmas, become possible 
that can be extended and made more frequent. And there's parallels for staff working in older people's care as well. So caring for older people can also be really hard. But with the right support, staff um, can have those moments of high satisfaction and reward. And they can become more frequent and the moments of despair alleviated. What does this support look like? A health and social care system that's designed and funded to meet the needs that older people have and that enables and rewards high quality, individually tailored, compassionate care. But it's also a system in which staff are treated as human beings who need rest, refreshment and respite and care. And when a healthcare system works together in a connected way towards a shared goal of caring for everyone in it, then everyone wins. very much that's really really Thank great you. to hear um, it's really interesting when because obviously I was involved in some of that and reading the final reports and think it doesn't come alive in the same way as when you're sitting and you're hearing it all being presented so that was that was um, particularly um, good for me to hear that so um, we've got 15 minutes for people to ask questions I think it's a real opportunity while we've got Jackie here I'm sure there are some there must be some burning questions I know I've got a couple but um, I'll hold mine until there's silence from everybody else. So, um, questions did, from anyone? I'm going to start asking you questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go on. Uh, did it ring true for people? It's always yeah. important to feed this back to people on the front line and just get a sense check. Makes sense. Is it interesting? I'm, my background is ITU, mm. and um, if you look at the literature of what a lot of patients from ITU say, the same thing. It's they want they want to hear that you see them as an individual and not just that person in the end of the bed. And the problem we often have with intensive care patients is that they appear to be asleep, but they actually can hear mm. what's going on. Mm. And if you're not demonstrating to them that you know that they've got a cat at home and a, or a biddy mm. who's a boy and who's looking after him, if you don't connect, get that information across to them, they don't, they, again, lose their sense of identity. And, and they can often be very agitated and distressed, and it's because they think that something bad is going on because you don't know their person. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of what you said fits very much with what we see with our ITU patients. Isn't that's, it? that's really interesting. And the study I talked about that focused on dementia, um, in fact, people often labelled any behaviour as, well, that's the dementia, rather than really trying to understand what was going on for that person. And that was sort of you know a fairly consistent finding. So um, I think sometimes the labels can get in the way of really trying to um, get in, get in there. We just one more. It's quite hard sometimes when you're looking after a patient and you're looking at the next appeal, and sometimes the next appeal is not so many issues as the patient. Yeah. So we try to support the next appeal as well. Absolutely. And I didn't talk about it, but in that review I mentioned that see who I am, and that's as important for the relatives as it is for the it's about everybody in that set. Can the rules that the study, did they work short shifts or were they working in the um, I think it was a mixture. Uh, so long tended to predominate, but um, but it, it was tended to be a mixture. So you didn't get that sort of overlap of the golden the golden days overlap. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what, what's your, what's your experience? Of? I've always worked short shifts most yeah. of my career. I've only just in the last five years done long days. Um, and I find a few different the environment I work in is very different. I don't actually work on the morning environment, so the long days stick to the team I work for the yeah. moment. Yeah. But having been a ward manager and having long days um, on the board I found it very difficult that you don't have that overlap time, yes. you don't have that communication time. But um, the, the actual communication between the team is very spread as well. So um, you have less time for giving on-hand care because 
there's always another job to run to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas when you have a double amount of staff in the middle of that two hour lap over, you've got so much more to achieve. Yeah. Um, Sundays, teaching time, everything. So um, yeah. I really agree with, with, with that. Yeah. But of course, and people like, I like the long shifts. Yeah, so yeah. I was going to yeah. say, I know there's a team at University yeah. Southampton who are doing quite a lot of work around the mm -hmm. shifts and have done some of the. Um, I think it's now been um, with evidence. Yeah, well, yeah so I've done quite a lot of the evidence. Um, yeah. Flyers about that sort of thing. I know there's quite a lot of work done around that. So. Yeah. As yeah. I'm conscious we've got quite a lot of allied health professionals in the room, and I um, and I appreciate the focus was nursing, but I wonder whether there was any sense um, in in the observation that Johnny were actually about you know, like the connectedness of that AHP team and its relationship with the nursing and the patients, and actually a sense of actually what. Would, was there any significance in that in terms of, you know, how did it all pan out? So we we did so in terms of the intervention, we did just look at the nursing team because we wanted to keep it manageable, but recognising nursing as a team within a team within a team sort of thing. So where, where do you stop? I mean the potent so all of those messages about you know a good team and receptiveness, compassionate care, that would apply to any team in any in any setting in health and social care. So you could think about how might you build those principles into a nursing home setting, say. It's it would look different. Yeah, they're there all day. Yeah. yeah. They're not visiting. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's part of yeah. yeah, I just was uh, and it was part of the sort of early conversation was where does the team start mm. stop them, you know, and I'm I'm doing a session on Monday to the FY ones who are all starting up, you know, and one of those things will be about the fact, you know, the family that you're joining and how you care for each other, regardless of whether you were OT physio, you know, and it, 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 those things are really important in the practice setting, aren't they? Because as you've all got to pull together to... It's sort of looking at the to your thing about yeah, the organised... I mean, I know in, in what you talk about, it was actually about actually the broader things, so that, you know, the division heads of nursing, for example, the director, and actually I can understand actually why that's, you know, that, that consistent. Sydney, but also the coming going of those who actually are part of the team, yes. but also at some point it's um, really quite very interesting to think about how you enact that as an intervention with that, and, but at the same time make it manageable. Yes. Yeah. Is there yeah. anyone in the room who was observed? I'm just, just interested whether there was anyone from the research who's in the room. If they are, they give. If they're all, they give. Yeah. <laughs> if you were, you were in the good yeah, you've got observations. Got a lot to be proud that's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just skew all of the extra consent. <laughs> Any other questions from people? So, do you want to know what happens? What happens next? So that, so that, that the data I presented on staffing level and skill mix. Do you know what? That's the first prospective data that's ever been gathered to prove a link between staffing level skill mix wow. and quality of um, interaction. So we're just finishing off that paper now and hopefully it will add to that growing body of evidence about the importance of getting um, staffing right on top of the rewards. So I should say, so that's a fact. So there's been, so there's all the critical data actually about you know, mortality, but actually this is the first time the link between actually watching what happens well and also and the, the way that the staffing level uh data has been. so often in studies like peter's you gather staffing levels from the rotors yeah. and from the hospital records rather than, rather than what actually happens yeah. whereas what we did before the two hours we went on the ward and we said who's on the Excuse ward you. and that and we counted that way so that was real time prospective data collection which makes it a much stronger picture than relying on because as we all know there's sometimes a bit of a mismatch between yeah. what's on the road to what actually uh, really happens. Really powerful and important issues. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that focus on compassion. Like that. And that focus on <laughs> compassionate care, I guess. We like it. As opposed yeah. to, <laughs> you know, it's about yeah. the interactions, isn't it? The quality yeah. of the interaction. Yeah. 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 But for all of this, I mean, I, I didn't particularly make that link, but I would say, well, you all know this, if, if, you, if we get compassionate care right, actually, then you're much more likely to you know, help people stay well and yeah. to get out of hospital quick because you're getting things right for them and you're, you know, you're hearing from them as to what's important. So, so I think it, it, it's not, it's not a separate thing. I, I think sometimes compassionate care is seen as a luxury extra yeah. and we all, you know, and the government holds their hands up when, you know, we're not seen to be caring anymore. But actually, it's all part of getting high quality care right. And then people study? Uh, so, so we're applying for funding to um, 
well, we've got, we've got a number of studies going into the future based on this. The trial, we're not ready to do yet. Because of this finding that different wards respond in different ways, actually, we want to spend a study really trying to understand on what does a receptive ward look like so that you target your resource at that because some wards are in such a position where actually it's it's not worth putting the intervention in because uh, it might be for example their ward managers just left or their staffing levels are really poor or their turnover is really high so some of those you can help and you get in there and, and you use collect to try and turn things around but some of them are in a position where you just think actually it's going to be really unhelpful for this ward for somebody to be coming in and say come on <laughs> Let's all be more compassionate. Uh, so our next study, we're going to try and work out um, how we can define the wards who would be able to benefit from something like this and leave the ones alone for whom the time is just not right at the moment. Uh, so and that's I, the next and one. And I think that chimes so much with so many of the things that we know around, you know, the strength of leadership, some of yeah. the stuff we do with our clinical accreditation, yes. the timing of that, you know, actually timing sometimes is everything in terms of timing and leadership. Yeah. So once we work that out then we can uh, then we then we can run a trial. Yeah. So we can do that bit. Just going back to one of the things you were talking about a bit earlier around um, people being able to um, it sounds as though you were talking about, you know, all, all the um, targets that we have. So you know you've got to turn things and then you've got these kind of not tick box exercises but we're being monitored um, for whether we give care by a lot of things that we do and, and so I'm getting the impression that um, it can be difficult to give compassionate care in some ways because you're trying to to meet all of these targets that you described um, and how do you empower people therefore to to be expert practitioners and say, okay, I, I can not do that, that's the point, because that is right for that patient. So a lot of it's about uh, leadership, so um, RNs being able to be out there enough that they're influencing um, what goes on. Um, and it's about everybody feeling to some extent, actually, that patient come what what they need comes first and be able to mediate. So it's about, you. Sort of, you sort of, you're in a broker role, really, yeah. aren't you? You're trying to work out versus everything I know I've got to do here that will help keep things on track and ticking over versus what this patient is requiring me to do. It's working out how to do that. And I think leadership and, what, and, and team support. And organisation requires of you as well. Yeah, because. and I guess keeping the staff, keeping the staff sustained in a way that means they can deliver those things in a compassionate, because yeah. it's not, mm, they're, they're not, not mutually, separate, no, mutually no. exclusive. Mm, yeah. And that's the care, you know, the, mm. the compassionate care of staff. Yeah. Mm. is as important as the compassion of care patients. Yeah. Um, I think that was the last hand, just going, going, go, gone. Oh, one more hand gone up. Um, how long did you, um, or when did you collect the follow-up data after the trial? So, um, so we did the intervention for four months, or the start of the intervention, and then we came back four months later. But in actual fact, we're doing some follow-up. So we finished this about two or two and a half years ago now. <laughs> um, we're actually following up some of the wards now because we're really interested to see what happens over the longer term. And um, what we're finding, this is preliminary findings, brand new, don't tell anybody. Uh, but some wards, it's as if we were never there. And some wards, it's carried on. And in, exactly in line with our, with our theories about why that could why that be. And offline from the evidence. We also know in some wars the things that happened that people thought were great have spread like wildfire mm. to under, you know, so because people were looking in and thinking, yeah, why don't we do a bit more? And that's made us think about for the next study, actually we need to capture some of that. So again, not just intervening uh, with the team and looking beyond them, but actually we need to look at what happens to the spread of those ideas in an organisation when it seems to be a good thing. Particularly where staff move around, you know, where mm -hmm. you talked about golden days yeah um, when staff didn't move around so you know actually when staff moving around if you're used to having get together in huddles and one ward and then you go somewhere else and that's not what happens and we notice it yeah thank you very much i think we will thank you in our usual tradition